hearing from somebody who is um, not only founded his first company when he was 16, um, he's a Leo Award winner, he's the innovator under 35, all titles, but of course he's an entrepreneur, a fa a, a really a passionate entrepreneur, he's the CEO of Magazino. Simple storage for Industry 4.0, pick cost reducing with robots, that's around the subject, cheap thrills, expensive pace, the bills, and we are very glad that he is here. Please give now a big round of applause to Frederik Brandner from Magazino. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for the invite. My name is Frederick, um, one of the co-founders of Magazino. Um, I've got the title of CEO, but I usually say I'm responsible for the food um, because we've got our own chef and I make sure that there's enough money um, in the company, so it's finance and sales to, to pay the food. Um, what we did, you already talked about robotics for a second. Um, everybody's talking about the future of work, that robots are going to take over. Um, you know maybe the Frey and Osborne study um, that he's even present at the DLD conference this weekend. And the problem is people usually think of robots and then they think of one of those KUKA arms. So one of those arms which does the repetitive um, welding spot at BMW. They do that over and over again. They do that reliable, they do that quite cheap. Um, but this is not the area of robotics we are talking about. The robotics we are talking about is different in four major ways. The one is that it has an eye, so it's vision-based, 2D and 3D and LiDAR sensors. That it second decides at runtime by itself, so it goes around, for our example, through a warehouse and decides by itself what to do. And thirdly, that it does that parallel to the human, in a human world, so we do a human job in a human world with a normal robot. And fourthly, that we gather a lot of information and data which then helps us to um, release those robots into the real world. Our ultimate goal one day is to build a brain for those robots, right? So we're talking about software um, which is enabling different kind of robots to be out there in the physical world taking over jobs which were done by humans beforehand. Um, but the problem for a startup, if you start out and say, okay, I'm going to build a robot brain, um, first of all, it would take forever. Um, you most probably wouldn't do any revenues in an early stage. Um, you wouldn't get funding because there's no market yet. So that would be a very difficult way. So we had to look for a specific entry market, a niche market to start in. Um, and in our case, it's the logistics market. Why logistics? Um, because on the one side, logistics is simple enough, so you've got even floors, a structured environment, educated personnel, um, you have a warehouse management system where you already know what you've got in stock. So it's pretty different, for example, to your rooms of your children at home where it's complete chaos and your kids run around and you don't really know what you've got. Uh, putting a robot into this environment is way more complex than in a warehouse. But still, in a warehouse, um, the job we are doing, um, we are pretty big in picking shoe boxes, for example, for Zalando or Deichmann. Um, so we pick shoe boxes, bring them to the front and bring them to the back. Um, when you send them back, we're putting them into the shelf again. Um, that is usually done by humans because classical automation, PLC controllers, SEMATIC components, um, we just couldn't deal with this complexity. And thirdly, it's a good market to start in because you can start with a specific niche in our area, for example, shoe boxes or books, and then you can scale up over time and do more complicated objects. So to have an idea of um, how our robots work and what they look like, it's ideally because we've got a physical product to have a look at the video. very simple formula. We have to be cheaper than the human. So it's cost per pick. That's what it's all about. How much does a human cost per hour? How fast can he walk and pick those pairs of shoes? And on the other side, how cheap is our cost per pick? So how much does a robot cost and um, how fast are we? 
And I think this is fundamental to understand when you think about your startup, because what does that mean? That means that when you start a company like this, um, it's different to a web online store maybe, where um, the usual rule is that your customer acquisition costs have to be smaller than customer lifetime value. So you have to be good at marketing, you have to be good at a lot of other things which I'm not good at. Um, in our case, we knew it's all about technology because um, when you are cheaper than the human in cost per pick, you have to do three things. The one is you have to make it happen at first. first. Nobody ever put robots into warehouses doing human tasks in that manner. Um, once you've made that happen, you have to be fast enough um, and you have to build those robots cheap enough from a hardware and software point of view. But all three questions are um, technical questions. Um, and that is important to understand because then when you start, um, your focus is on technology and you need a lot of money to do that. Um, it's just impossible to build a complex product like this with maybe a million funding at the beginning. Um, you have to have a lot more and you have to have a bigger team because you have to do so many um, different niches. So you have, a, you have a technological problem on the one side, um, you're doing something nobody has done before. There were robots, of course, doing similar tasks, but they were usually built by European Union funded tech products or projects um, for some university to do a one-time demo, but this is a big step to take something from it works once to it works 24-7 and reliable and fast enough. Um, and the major difficulty, of course, also is to have a, a robot doing a human-like job, uh, because the complexity um, when you are talking about a non-deterministic system, so a robot which runs around in a warehouse to give this robot the capabilities to do something the human was doing is, is way more difficult. Um, I usually um, explain that at the beginning our robots sometimes drove into the shelves and some of our um, technicians are here today and um, they usually were talking, the, Togo, the robots called Togo and they said bad Togo and they were all shouting with them um, and I thought okay those are you know IT guys, they should think in zero and ones and if they already start shouting on our robots something is majorly wrong. Um, and I think we are at the level now that our robot is like a little kid so he's able to ride a bike, he knows that there's gravity, um, he doesn't run against the walls, the doors anymore and and he can fulfill his jobs. But what the core of what we're actually doing is that the data we're gathering while we go through those warehouses is making the robots better and better day by day. Um, so we've sold about 40x robots. We have about 15 in live operations. The other ones are to be delivered. Um, and those are doing real life jobs at the moment. So they, they go somewhere, pick a pair of shoes, and of course we learn a lot. So for example, if one robot would grasp a teddy bear somewhere in China, um, and he knows how to grasp a teddy bear, because he learned how to grasp a teddy bear, a robot in Germany would um, benefit from that information. Um, so the knowledge and the get data is key in getting those robots better. So it's on one side it's knowing the environment, on the other side it's knowing the objects, it's a representation of the tasks themselves, and of course also of um, the robot itself. So somehow having an idea how long are your arms, uh, what are kind of capabilities you are. But once again, so the complexity in terms of <laughs> To have those robots doing what they need to do, you need people for computer vision, you need people for navigation, you need people for higher level control, you need to, um, people for the safety, and this is only the software side. Um, then you need people for the mechanical development, you need industrial designers, you need electricians to do the cabling, etc. Et so um, it all comes down to money. Um, and maybe to add one thing, the, the, the additional problem is that at the moment this is the game, but when you look into the future, um, I strongly believe that hardware is going to become a commodity. So you have to kind of focus your company already in the early stage to be the software company um, that will be able to work with uh, robots produced in China, but then bring the brain what we are wanting to design on there, while you still have the complexity that you have two and a half thousand parts which you have to put together today. So um, you're kind of killing yourself in the complexity game there. Um, but at the end of the day, I think um, it is, can all be solved um, with, that's maybe very blunt, but can be solved with money and time and good people. <laughs> um, and so how did we start? Um, we actually had no idea that we were building robots at the very beginning. I was visiting a friend and she was rebuilding one of, she was rebuilding her pharmacy and she got one of those machines. That's why you have those, they have a very simple robot kind of system in there. And I thought I want to have something like that at home. So I just show all my, um, trash into or my stuff into a drawer and automatically sorts it and if I want to need something I go through my cover flow and it dispenses what I want. Um, that was the first idea and then I met some people and they said well it's way too expensive and nobody ever is going to buy it. 
Um, then we went into the direction to build exactly one of those machines for pharmacies. Um, so we classical German startup where we got Exist first, we had Heidi Kunder for as investor, um, and we went pretty far. The machine was um, distributed to that pharmacy, but realized that it's a pretty bad market because pharmacies, um, they, you know, they only have one pharmacy, up to three in total. They don't read the model their pharmacy constantly. We shipped one of those robots, and whenever it didn't work, the pharmacy had to close down because we could, they couldn't dispense any medications. Um, so pretty bad business at the beginning, but we learned a lot, and we learned a lot of the um, how to run a robot at that time already, which is vision-based. Um, so deciding um, by looking at things through his cameras um, and deciding on that to do something. Um, so where are we today? Um, we after we got Heide Kunderfall, that was quite an intense time. We were about six-ish people at that time, eight-ish at the end. That was in 2015. And then we got a large corporate um, um, to be investing in us. Um, that was in May 2015, and then we kind of pushed the reset button um, and threw out the product of the, the pharmacy and said, okay, we use the technology, we use everything what we learned, and we're going into the uh, market, um, which is, in that sense, this brain for robots, and the first product, the robot for uh, picking shoe boxes and other rectangular objects. Um, today, we are about um, 86 um, people. Um, We've got, um, we're still building our hardware ourselves. We're in the process of outsourcing it. Um, I think we're pretty far with um, the capabilities of the robots. Um, what you've seen is the robot for shoe boxes. We've got now one for larger boxes because not everything is at that size, but of course um, some fashion items are bigger. Um, we also already today sell software to, for example, KUKA and Swisslock. They buy vision software from our side to control their robots again, so their hardware um, to pick more complex objects. Um, and we are live in um, companies like Deichmann, Puma, um, Zalando Lounge, etc. With, with our robots. Um, but um, I can tell you it's not getting easier. So I always thought that, you know, once you step to, I always said, okay, when we get Exist, everything is going to be good. And then we got Exist and I thought, okay, now everything is, is fine. Then um, sometime after we said, okay, now we need deal financing. Then we had the Heitrich um, Gründerfonds and usually they always said no to us at first hand. So Exist didn't like us at first, HTGF didn't like us at first. Um, and then we had the exist time, uh, had to get F time for a year, and then we already knew time is running out and money is running out, and uh, we couldn't pay our wages for the last months. And then eventually we made it to the first financing round, um, and then we got Siemens on board. And um, then I thought, okay, now there's so much money in the company, everything is going to be fine. Um, and then two and a half years later, you're in a similar situation again. So it continues um, to be a tough way, I think. Um, and I think one of the major um, maybe beliefs or uh, attributes to an entrepreneur is that you just live with this risk and not go completely crazy. Um, but what I want to finish up with and then maybe um, open up to some questions is, um, as I started at the beginning, I think although um, hardware, it's a hardware business, um, we are mostly a software company and even we're getting even more in software step by step. Um, there are maybe some unique obstacles for hardware because, for example, you um, order some motors and then you ordered the wrong ones and you just waited 6,000 euros on wrong motors because somebody just messed up two numbers in the ordering and you can't send them back because it's business to business. Um, or you order motors and they have to be there in three weeks and then they tell you, well, the Chinese factory doesn't work anymore and you have to wait another 15 weeks and you have to completely redesign everything because you can't get the product. Software is easier because you just push compile and then um, it goes through. Um, but at the end of the day, um, and I think even with high tech, um, and I think we're pretty high tech because we have all different fancy things which you can talk about at the moment from computer vision to cloud where the data is gathered to uh, machine learning for, for the robots and robotics as a high tech topic as well. Um, it comes all down um, to the people. Um, I think that's, that's key when, when you start. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, my job is pretty simple. I have to make sure that um, the team, that we've got the right people and that the people are happy and um, a good factor for that is food. Um, so, um, I think food buys happiness. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frederick. Food buys happiness. Questions are the most important food on a conference like this. Ah, I, you take the microphone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both. Both. This. 
you're very demanding. <laughs> okay, so first question, gentlemen here in blue, and then one with the glasses. We use that, whatever. You, will you make chick chuck snook? First one blue. Who's the first? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Uh, hi, I wanted to ask you how was it for you to find the right people to start a company? I mean, the process right now exists, and I get how it's really complicated to find somebody that you can share your idea with and that it's going to give you the time and the work. So, how was it for you to find the people? And make it make make it work. Yeah, um, finding people is crucial. Um, I would have to say that everybody we employed after us three founders is a lot smarter and a lot more capable than we three are. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the first, we had a very very good choice with our very first employee, which now had the hardware. Um, we have like just those people who came in. How do you find them? It's just pure networking. I don't think there's a um, solution. You know, you find the one co-founder at this event, then you talk to somebody else. Um, at the beginning, you of course, you maybe have different kind of people. Our first employee, we met him at an event somehow, and then he came the next morning, and he wanted to do his PhD, but then he decided, um, he came in for an interview at 10, and then he just stayed. And he stayed <laughs> until 6 o'clock, just started working, and he came the next day again, and we could pay him, right, because we didn't have any money. And he was um, staying there for the next six weeks, and then eventually got a contract because Heidi couldn't have signed, and then he <laughs> became an employee, and now he's heading the whole team. But that is just, we had so much luck in finding the right people. I think without the people, uh, Magazine would by far not be there. What a nice trick, just stay if you like a job. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, now, uh, the general with the blue shirt, no? You are next, no? Okay, next question. Ah, then the lady here, please. Since you're selling such an expensive product and you mentioned how uh, it's going to be cheaper than a human anyways, how do you convince your customers that it's really worth it, especially considering that I'm sure that they also have to pay for service and warranty packages per year, and yeah, basically how do you do your sales? Yeah, so we have sold the first machines for 100,000 each. And now we changed the business model to 55,000 um, and then a recurring software fee of 15,000 per robot per year. So when you sum it up over four years, it's more expensive than 100,000. Um, but <laughs> it's cheaper for them to start off. And of course, we bring in the idea that the robots get better over time because it is a software game um, and therefore they pay for the software. How do we do sales? Um, I have to say we did um, a lot of, um, at the beginning, we had our, our second employee was an industrial designer. Um, so we had uh, um, some visuals, some renderings, a little handy um, yeah, just toy thing which I could show our vision. And of course, we didn't have a product yet. Um, but the customer has a huge problem. And I think when you have a high-tech startup and you don't start from the problem side, but you start from the solution, you're lost. But we started from a problem side where the people really looking for something, right? They don't find people. It's a major problem. The Amazon warehouse close to Munich is half empty because they don't find another thousand people to work in there. So there is a huge demand for something to solve this. Um, and then we just came and did a lot of um, public relations. We just did a lot of you know shout out that we are the coolest gang of the world and uh, built fancy robots. Um, and I and promised the idea. And then there comes a moment where they talk to you, and then you should maybe be a little bit more. Um, coming down and say, well, we're not there yet, but we go on to a journey <laughs> together, um, which is important because if you then overpromise, then uh, you have a problem afterwards. So our first customers, we told them, well, this is the idea we want to go to. Um, we are on our way. You can see what we're able to do today, but there's still a long process. And, and even today, it's a process, right? We are not 100% there where we promised to be. Um, we're still a few percent off in terms of picks per hour, um, but we're getting there. It's Sorry, real, real quick also. Just a... It's on. Okay. <laughs> Just an additional follow-up then. So are you saying that um, it's not like you're replacing humans or replacing a solution for a better, but you're rather solving a problem that ha people haven't solved yet, right? It's like something new that you're introducing versus something that you're trying to replace. Well, they don't really don't find people. So I'm usually when I'm on a, um, some people, some person is going to ask, um, what are we doing with the people and are we replacing the people and what's the future of work? And that is an important discussion to um, take care of. Um, when we can talk about two hours about that. What I do know is that at the moment they just don't find people, right? There's no unemployment, um, the people just, nobody wants to do this job, um, so they really, really struggle in all over Germany to find people um, to do this job. But of course, if you look further down the road, um, there will be a need, um, there will be some changes, most probably some um, jobs will be taken over, 
Um, but what I usually like to compare it is, at, in the past 81 million people went shopping, right? If we're gonna buy everything online, who's gonna do the, you know, it's not the 81 ma million people because they're gonna sit at home. So somebody has to do the picking work and that can't be done all by other humans. So it has to be some sort of robot. All right, okay, last short question here. Get a microphone. Um, so I just wanted to know, you said that uh, your robots are actually learning things, so is that where you see the future of your company, artificial intelligence? <laughs> well, AI is a big topic, and of course, um, they, we have different elements in there. But of course, a robot at the beginning, um, because it is based on data, so a robot looks into the world and has to have an understanding, where am I, what's my job, um, am I, I look in front of me and see a bottle, and um, you can do that by traditional means of, of software, uh, but of course you can also say, um, we have one example, for example, an empty shelf, and to identify an empty shelf is pretty difficult with, uh, with a camera to say that there's nothing, it's way more difficult to say what is there. Um, and so uh, what we do is every time we look into a shelf, we take a picture and gather a lot of pictures with labeled data, and that's a nice thing of robots, that the, the data is usually always labeled, and then you can have machine learning on those things. So yes, um, there's, tons of activities in the company to use this um, and it will pay on two things. One is the robot will be coming faster, so the cost per pickle is going to go down even further. The robot will have more capabilities because it can grasp things and identify things which it wasn't possible before, uh, for example very small shoe boxes. Or um, thirdly, um, um, the robot will um, just be more robust and all that is paid on by definitely by AI topics. All right, so we heard also that it's a very psychological job in a way, uh, like walk the edge between selling a product or selling a vision. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for Frederik Brandt.